This is the new moon of August. We've had two weeks have passed since we entered the traditional Vasa retreat. And for the past week, we've been on a retreat, special kind of formal retreat. And what is the result? Uh, to observe this results of our efforts, what we do, what we think, what we feel. And reflecting on the result isn't necessarily, you know, a critical not seen it in terms of good retreat, bad retreat, but it's like this. And what is a good retreat? And and what is a bad retreat? And then we're back into this into the critical mind comparing, you know, the retreat I had last year was better than the one I had this year. So the critical mind is not to be trusted. It's, uh, it's all right when it comes to worldly situations, comparing, you know, what is bigger or smaller, or but in terms of um, realizing truth, you can't depend on it. <coughs> the critical mind lies. It's a liar. It deludes. So, so in, in the, so I don't expect you to believe, but this is for you to see how much you can believe your critical mind. What you think of yourself, how you see yourself, self-criticisms, are they really true? Any of them? Or the way we regard others, or the world we live in, you know, is through various biases, conditioned ways of seeing and experiencing life. What can we trust then? Yeah. What is trustworthy? And that, of course, you all know the answer to that. <laughs> and that is awareness. The, the state of attention, of attentiveness, which is a non, which is non-critical, but it's certainly uh, not oblivious to qualities or condi- or the qualities of condition phenomena. But it isn't preferring. It isn't, uh, you know, attaching or trying to reject or keep anything. So now the, this uh, new week begins where uh, many of you are going on self-retreats in the, in the forest and you'll be left to your own uh, devices. In a formal retreat you've got structure and uh, to us uh, rely on. <coughs> They're various, you know, morning 
puja, reflections on Dhamma, and then, then uh, evening puja, and then the, the day is scheduled for 45 minute sitting period, walking periods alternating, afternoon, hour periods, sitting, walking, sitting, and so forth. So this structure and form um, is the, the result of using structures that you don't create, that, are, that we all agree to, we've all decided this past week to, to use this form, this structure, and then conform to that, to that structure. In some ways, that makes it quite, I find that uh, structures easier to operate in. Because uh, somehow when it, it's something to kind of fill your day. <clears throat> it's time for sitting, time for walking, morning puja, evening puja, tea time. And of course, probably you'll get so blissed out in the forest that you'll even forget meal time. <laughs> but don't expect that. Huh? So when you have what we call self-retreat, then the, you know, the structures are up to you, what you, you know, how you want to, what kind of uh, schedule you use and, or decide upon or don't decide. But what's important to uh, emphasize in, is to, is the awareness, so that you know, the, that whatever happens, whatever you're doing, you, you, take, you have moments where you're really observing the way it is. Now, I could come from a very authoritative position saying you, you should really not waste any time in the forest that you're weak, to, you know, really, uh, you know, suck it to them, go at it. 100%, don't waste any time, don't even sleep. Just practice, practice, practice. Kind of gung-ho advice. And then recite the usual adages about laziness is the, is the, uh, one of the great human defects and we should work hard uh, and practice in order to become enlightened. But what's more important is seeing how words and concepts and ideas and ideals affect consciousness. So this is, you know, we're, when we come from our cultural background, isn't it? Most of us come from very goal-oriented uh, societies where uh, the workaholic is the is the is the result of our lives. Usually, we become obsessed with doing, and we feel guilty about not doing anything. And so, the even practice of meditation, monasticism, can be another obsession, another compulsion that we. Uh, not that it is meant to be that way, but we can. This is maybe how we. We, we use the, uh, the convention itself as another whipping post, another thing we've got to prove. We've got to prove ourselves, prove that we're worthy, good samanas, uh, worthy of our alms food, that we're not wasting time. We're w working hard every moment of the day and night. And so the, this kind of obsession with doing, with the feeling that we, that um, the, the guilt that arises from not doing something. Or from doing something that we don't think is quite 
up to the high standard we might have. So what I'm encouraging is the trust in your awareness. You know, the, to get to know yourself, how you, how you do things, how you, you know, how does self-retreat, what does that mean, how does that affect your conscious consciousness? When they say you have a week or two weeks of self-retreat, And not, as I said, emphasized before, not, not to criticize anything if you, whatever you, whatever that perception, how that affects you, just it is like this. And notice how uh, self-retreat, it can, it can mean, go, oh, wonderful, I don't have to go to pujas in the morning. I'm on my own and listen to the birds in the trees and the, watch the squirrels jumping from tree to tree or read novels or do what I want uh, out in nature. But the but important thing is to, to listen to, to this. So you get to know how, you know, what, not in terms of judging or criticizing, but recognizing this is, it's like this. So that you're trusting more in your awareness than any ideals you have about what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing or, um, you know, getting caught up in, in just the, uh, trying to, your obsessive tendencies. It's not that we shouldn't, you know, condemning obsessive tendencies, but the, you know, it's when these tendencies operate and enslave us, we become victims of our habits and obsessions, and, and then our life, it, we, it, we, we tyrannize ourselves. We can make our lives incredibly complicated and difficult and unpleasant, <clears throat> you know, not because of anyone being the cause, but because the the way we tend to uh, hold uh, ideas about ourselves and what should or shouldn't be. <coughs> now when I say the mindfulness of listening, uh, the, as I've explained this many times before, listening to yourself and this sense of Listening like you're to someone talking on the other side of the fence, some, somebody you're do, you have no great emotional investment in, that they're, whatever they're saying, you're just listening, like listening in to the, to the people on the other side of the fence gossiping or chatting away. And your relationship to them is just the listener, not, not the critic, the judge, the, the one who you know, it sends them to heaven or hell for what they're saying or thinking, but just the witness, the listener, mindfulness. <clears throat> Words do affect us emotionally, so, you know, you know, how, uh, when uh, I remember uh, in the early days before we came and came to Chitters, when we were living at Oakenhold in this, this the Buddhist center in Oxford, and uh, John Coleman was giving these, uh, he was a, a meditation teacher of Uba, uh, under Uba Kim, and he, he would, play the Goenkaji's tapes. This was before the videos arrived. And uh, and so we go, so I met Tamarako on here. <laughs> and so we, we uh, and John Coleman would ask us to sit in the, during these retreats. So we quite enjoyed, you know, and Venerable Anando and Viridhamma and I, we'd, we join these retreats and they have a 
a meditation hall about this size and we'd be sitting up front on platforms and then all the others would be sitting out there. And, uh, and then the Goenka style of meditation, sweeping practice. And so then they'd have these periods of uh, what they call maximum determination. Now, I found I could sit for several hours w without any pain. You know, I quite developed sitting practice. But as soon as they said maximum determination, <laughs> within a five minutes I was agonizing. <laughs> so contemplate that maximum determination. Now, I don't know how those two words affect you, but but obviously this was this was twenty nine years ago or so. But they, um, you know, they. It means you've really got to put forth the effort and try hard, all your effort, and don't move, don't, you know, during this period of maximum determination. So that would, that when they, when, whenever they'd say that this is a period of maximum determination, and everybody, you feel the whole room going tense. <laughs> you know, everybody's contracting and going tense, and 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 I am along with it. You know, so that creates pain, doesn't it? Tension, a lot of tension. You know, when you contract your body, and 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 that then it. It, uh, you're actually creating conditions for increasing pain in it. <clears throat> so, just to see how the you know the ordinarily when when maximum determination wasn't the, the the concept, you know, then one could practice, and you know, then I found that then I could sit quite comfortably for long periods of time. <laughs> So these are being aware of how words affect you, you know, it's not that because uh, they affect me like that doesn't mean they affect you in the same way. But only you can know, you know, how different concepts, ideas, uh, tones of voice, you know, the way somebody speaks, you can, you get, you can feel something in it, you feel uh, maybe it makes you feel happy, or it create, you feel threatened, or tense, just by a tone of voice. So this is just recognizing that this is a sense realm that we're experiencing, the, the uh, human realm that we're that we're in this. You know, we are a conscious form, sensitive form in this realm. It's like this. Sensitivity is like this. So when I reflect in this way, sensitivity is like this, I'm not describing or defining how it, how it is, but that is a way of, of using thought to, to open to, to the obvious uh, and the reality of being sensitive at this moment. That the, that the human body, the senses that we have, the eyes, ears, tongue, body, the mind, everything, this whole, the whole experience from birth to death in the human form is the reality of sensitivity. And sensitivity is like this. So then you, when you reflect in this way, you know, you're aware of, of the body. It's a totally sensitive form on this, uh, on this uh, planet. You know, so this body is like this, and we use the body as a focus uh, for, for a, a, a foundation for mindfulness. Gayanupasana Saripatana, isn't it? It's a, uh, one of the first foundation of mindfulness. Because it's the most obvious, it's the, you know, it is what we have to live with for a life 
time. Whatever the uh, condition it might be in. You know, some people are born with very healthy, good-looking bodies that, you know, that um, they have strong constitutions, good health, vigor, uh, strength, beautiful complexion, and, and then the others, they, the, the extremes of people born with all kinds of defects, disabilities, things wrong, weak constitution, poor digestion, uh, psoriasis, asthma, and it's not fair, is it? Some people get the best, some people get the worst, and, and, and then there's the whole range that most of us fit into in between the best and the worst. <laughs> but it is the way it is, you know, when we try to think of it being fair, of course it's not fair in terms of, of that way of perceiving. The fairness is, is a worldly concept, isn't it? And it's about how things should and shouldn't be. But the way it is, it's not a kind of a fatalistic resignation, but a, an awakened state, an observing, being conscious. This is a conscious form. Consciousness is operating right now. Consciousness is like this. Sensitivity is, I'm experiencing the sensitivity through this body and its senses. So sensitivity means pleasure, pain, doesn't it? There's sukha vedana, tukha vedana, atukha matsukha vedana. Vedana is a feeling. Now that applies through everything that we, you know, that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. Isn't it? Th pleasant thoughts is, is sukha, unpleasant thought is dukkha. Neither pleasant nor unpleasant thoughts is atuka matsuka. Apply that to what you see. Uh, when, because we're very, human beings, most of us are very attached to vision. We love to see things, look at things, experience life through, through viewing, through sight, through the eyes. And so the, the, the beauty, the ugly, and the neither beautiful nor ugly. And so, you know, when we're just operating on, on the attraction and aversion principle, and the beautiful we want, the ugly we don't want, the neither beautiful nor ugly we don't even notice. So, so much of our life, just uh, just through seeing, isn't it, is is not is not recognized because we don't notice it because it has no, it doesn't have the uh, uh, an extremity beautiful enough to attract us, nor is it ugly enough to repel us. So, so much of our life is. Is, uh, is like that, unnoticed. We can live our lives always for pleasure uh, and, and uh, running away, trying to get rid of, resist anything unpleasant, painful. And if we had no other choice, if this was just, uh, you know, where this is our fate, then we'd be just caught in this trap of sensitivity with no... No ability to reflect on it, to see it, or to transcend it. To be able to have perspective on sensitivity. We'd be merely caught in it. Operating on, on the, you know, on the pleasure pain um, uh, experiences with no ability to, to observe or learn or understand them. So this is where, like the Buddha's teaching, is waking up and observing, 
the way it is, like the Dhamma. The Dhamma is reality. This word Dhamma is, is real. So it's, it's not a kind of abstract metaphysical term at all. The reality of this moment When we see it as Dhamma, it means that awareness, mindfulness, is the way to seeing the Dhamma, the truth of the way it is, seeing reality, knowing reality. If we don't trust in this awakeness, then we, we get caught in the conditioning, which is... Uh, Identity with the with the five khandhas. I am my body. I am my feelings, my thoughts, my memories. I am all these things, and some of these things are good. Some are beautiful. Some are ugly. Some are desirable. Some undesirable. We compare ourselves with others, don't we? We think, why does why does that person have all the good luck? You know. And I don't. It's not fair. Life is not fair. Why are some people born in sick, sickly and weak and in poverty and others born beautiful, healthy and wealthy? It's not fair. And this is a critical mind and the sense of ourself uh, is, is uh, created out of this. Thinking liking, disliking, wanting and not wanting, comparing one thing with another. Now to try to think about thinking is, uh, is you know, there's no way out of that. You, you know, just trying to, to think that you shouldn't think or that, or try to, to just uh, Stop thinking as because you don't like it. That doesn't work either. But it's in getting in recognizing or realizing this natural state of attentiveness, mindfulness. So in the reflections that I've given in the in the mornings this past week are around just learning to trust this, recognize, realize awareness. You know, so it, it, it's so that you you begin to to uh, surrender, seek your refuge, give yourself to this awareness, because it is something that is the only possibility for trust, for liberation, for knowing reality at this moment here and now. There's no other possible way. You might be able to, to create a, a kind of refined uh, samadhi state for a while. You know, if you develop uh, absorptions. But then they, they can't sustain themselves. Uh, they, they, they're also impermanent. So they'll inevitably fail you you know, the, the absorptions into the refinements, mental refinements are still unsatisfactory. Because the lesson we learn from being human is like this, it's about the reality of this moment as is the body, the senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the mental conditioning, consciousness, and the, the way that all this can be seen in perspective is through awareness. The awareness is the gate to the deathless. So when I, uh, you know, aparuta desang amatasa tawara, the gate to the deathless are open. That the Buddha said this, this is a pronouncement. 
Now what right now is the gate to the deathless? Is that just, you know, something somebody said 2,500 years ago? <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe maybe it was even not properly translated. We could start doubting. <laughs> but anyway, I find that very inspiring. Because uh, otherwise, what uh, you know, there's no hope in terms of of the conditions that I experience personally. You know, it became obvious when I was thirty that that I was going nowhere as a person. I <laughs> and I couldn't imagine, you know, how to how to, uh, you know, how to, you know, what to do, because uh, I didn't have any kind of worldly ambitions. I wasn't ambitious for, for worldly attainments, you know, and had no longing to become rich or successful or uh, in the world. I'd been married and disappointed, disillusioned with that, I was educated, so I had experience in the world. I had professional experience and, and had a quite a nice life. It wasn't that my life was, uh, was an unpleasant one, but it was unsatisfying. I was just increasingly bored with it, with life in general. And then the life that I experienced in my kind of social background, I found incredibly boring. White middle class Christian America was the most boring <laughs> kind of life I could imagine as I, as I saw it. So I mean, it, this was not an attractive option to, to do what, what my parents wanted me to do. <laughs> And so the, the, the light, the only light at the end of a very dark tunnel was the, was the Buddha Dhamma. So that became obvious to me uh, uh, that this is what, what I was going to do. Because that's the only thing at the age 30, the only, the only perception that kind of uh, interested me, everything else. I was not interested in, no matter how hard I tried to be. So of course that propelled me into uh, going to Thailand and and uh, getting in, starting meditation, which leads up to where I am right now. Well, that. I found, I thought, you know, back when I was 30, I thought there was something wrong with me. It was kind of, you know, so maybe a depressed person or something emotionally, you know, something wrong. But now I see it as a kind of uh, spiritual uh, gift, really. Because uh, in that they call nipita or world weariness. Is, is not a kind of depression, you know, the world is any good and I can't stand it. It, it leads to depression. But just seeing, no longer believing in the worldly values or seeing the point of conforming and going along with a society that you don't particularly like and, and don't respect and don't trust. And there was reason because you could see that that the, the that it wasn't trustworthy. And that also there was a sense of in me of of a higher purpose. There must be something more, you know, in a human in a human life than than just, you know, what what my society held up to me, which wasn't inspiring to me, didn't, didn't interest or excite me in any way. 
So any kind of religious or spiritual goal But especially the one that, that uh, tra attracted me, that aroused faith in me, was uh, Buddhism. Because it offers this, this chance to reflect on experience, on life. I'm not the kind of person that, is, that believes easily. You know, so if people say, you have to believe in this, uh, I, I am, immediately start doubting it. It's a kind of perversity or I call it skeptical nature. <clears throat> so you have to believe in God. Can't do it. <laughs> so skeptical nature is one is one, of course, that doubts, questions. And that very doubting, questioning, skeptical tendency is what I've actually used in my practice as a monk. You know, just uh, in the monastic life and the, and the development of mindfulness because uh, doubt itself stops the thinking mind, doesn't it? It's, it's uh, you know, trying to, to find all the answers through the intellect, trying to find all the rationalizations, the solutions to the problems, answers to all the questions, answers to all the doubts in the mind with, with nice pat answers from textbooks or scriptures or given to me by various wise sages or teachers. But in spite of, of, of all the, the possibilities for, uh, you know, w reading wisdom teachings and hearing wise sages uh, speak. No matter how many times you hear, you know, the, the right answers to the questions and the good solutions to the problems, it's not coming from here, is it? It's still very much up in the head. You don't really know. As long as it remains abstract, and theor it's theoretical, it's possible, might be, could be, should be maybe, or shouldn't be. Because the thinking mind, that's all it can do. It, 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 uh, it, it, crea it creates problems, questions, doubts. But it can't solve them, it can't, you know, it can give answers to questions, but those answers are another form of not being sure. If your nature is a skeptical. So this is where one had to find out for oneself. You have to find out the, the you have to do it yourself. You have to look within yourself, not just say, well, uh, you know, uh, the Buddha said this. Some people hold everything the Buddha said is ultimately sacred, never to be questioned. They, if the Buddha said it, it's true. I can't believe that either. People think that's terrible in Buddhist countries. <laughs> But the Buddha made it very clear that that this was not what he was uh, encouraging. Was he kind of just grasping his ideas, and and then we all had to kind of follow along with that unquestioningly. But it was uh, the, notice the whole sense of Buddha is awakeness, learning to recognize this awakeness. So I would in the year, early years of meditation, I think awakeness. Mindfulness, here and now, thinking these concepts, santitiko, akaliko, ehi, pasiko, dhamma. Apparent here and now, timeless. Come and see. And opanayaka dhamma, which is, 
we, our translations, they confuse me. And Amaravati is leading onwards, and here's leading inwards. <laughs> but lead somewhere, anyway. <laughs> So I usually ignore open Nayaka Dhamma because <laughs> <laughs> But whatever, you know, English translations, the, the, the point is, is not, you know, to, 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 you can't, you know, to get it totally accurate, you know, satisfying everybody on the, you know, a perfect English translation for an open Nayaka, but what is this awareness, the, the, real, the reality of Dhamma now? You know, so it's a, it's a question, rhetorical question that you ask yourself. Not to, not for, to find an answer in some, some you, know, that you, you know, from Pali or from uh, scripture or for somebody else. But this question then is, is, is rhetorical, so you're, what is the Dhamma, here and now, apparent here and now. And so this then puts me in this, this, this uh, state of attentiveness. I start listening. Not looking for anything in particular, because then if I start looking for something, I'm thinking again, I've got to find this, or the Dhamma is, uh, you know, then I start getting wound up in my thinking process which is very, you know, that was very obsessive. It used to be very obsessive about thinking. So then it's more like listening. So I remember reading something about, in, you know, the, the ability to listen, the, uh, sense of, the sense of listening, hearing has this uh, kind of expansiveness to it. Because, you know, you're in a dark room or in a light, in a, in a well-lit hall or wherever you are, you're alone, whether you're with others, in a silent place or a noisy place. Listening then is, 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 is a, to me, gives me this sense of this awareness. Not listening at, for anything in particular, but just listening. And this uh, sense of listening isn't, you know, not trying to make myself listen, but just trust myself to listen. You know, if I get caught into the compulsive, I've got to listen, that I can see is another, uh, you know, condition I'm grasping. This compulsive that I've I'm trying to develop listening and become a good listener. And then I grasp this and then the compulsive self-view starts taking me over. So I don't trust that. So I find in the sense of relaxed attention. Is that an oxymoron? Relaxed attention. Whatever it is, attitude is relaxing, isn't it? Being at ease, opening. Attention isn't focused on one thing then. If I focus on this, or just listen, and it's forever, just the, the reality of listening, which includes everything. So now, in, in my practice, you know, this, this, uh, the awareness, the discerning ability to see uh, and to know the, the result of grasping conditions and non-grasping. You, you develop this uh, panya faculty through awareness. Like, just to see that creating myself as a person and whether I'm 
feeling happy or positive about myself or negative or neutral, any kind of personal quality that I attach to is is like this. As I know it, it's, I know the way it is. Attachment to a sense of me and mine. And then letting go of that. So the, the awareness then has this wide spectrum uh, that includes attachment, non-attachment, self and not-self. And this you, you can recognize, you know, th through the awareness only, it's not, not, it's not intellectual at all. <laughs> because it's a direct knowing, it's not an abstraction, uh, depending on language. But on your ability to trust your awareness, to realize, develop, cultivate this awareness. So knowing this, then it becomes quite clear. And the grasping conditions, being having a being, a, you know, believing in my personality, and getting caught up in my views and opinions about anything at all, is suffering. I feel somehow anxious and tense, or something. Even at its best, is not not complete. I remember the first time I went to Switzerland and you know, and they took me after the retreat, took me on a tour of Switzerland, very beautiful country. And and wherever we went, we were looking at beautiful mountains, beautiful villages, beautiful lakes, going up uh, these these kind of trains and cable cars and up to Restaurants on top of mountains, <laughs> and everything beautiful. And so there I was, you know, sitting in this car. We'd go to this beautiful place and that beautiful place, and and all the places in between was were beautiful. And I got exhausted. I was training, I was kind of eating up this beauty, you know, trying to, you know, look at this, look at that. And, and where it's kind of unrelenting beauty. So even in Switzerland, you know, people aren't particularly joyful and liberated in Switzerland, are they? Not no, noted for being joyful and happy. And yet, it is beautiful, and it's well run, and that's as good as you'll get on this planet. <clears throat> but the mindset, the mind state, isn't it, is... This is where we find our liberation, is through awareness rather than through uh, just uh, beauty. Beauty uh, as, a, as a goal in life is, is unsatisfying. Now awareness is neither beautiful nor ugly. It's uh, you know it, it's it's uh, it has no quality. You can't describe it really. You can only point to it. You can talk about concentration, samadhi, much more easily, because you know you can say you know concentrate on this, on and put your attention onto this, and then we can do that. So it's, uh, you know, and then hold your attention onto this object, and this is this is not difficult for us to do, because our conditioning is very much uh, samadhi kind of conditioning, isn't it? We 
We have to learn, we have to concentrate in order to get through the educational system. Putting effort in, a lot of us have, you know, a quite willful, strong character, so we, what we do, we go at, you know, with a great amount of effort. We have effort, we have concentration. We generally don't have any wisdom or very much faith. And mindfulness is not even, you know, it's not even mentioned. When I, in my experience with the formal education in the States, I don't think anyone ever used the word mindfulness. In fact, I didn't really come across this word until I started meditating, Buddhist meditation. <laughs> but I certainly had, you know, concentration and effort I had a certain amount of sadha, you know, to get me to, you know, interest, in other words, confidence in Buddhist teachings, enough faith or trust in the Buddhist teachings to want to do it, to try it out at least. When I first started, I wasn't sure it would work, you know, maybe it's just another pie-in-the-sky philosophy. You know, I used to love to read, you know, philo philosophical uh, on phil philosophy, you know, trying to, you know, ideas, the human intellect taking the idealism of, of the human heart, and, and I found so many things very inspiring. <clears throat> but then you can't sustain it, you know, and it doesn't work usually, it doesn't count, there's no practical way you can use it, just inspir inspired philosophies or interesting intellectual concepts or metaphysical uh, speculations. So then in the Buddha Dhamma, maybe this was just be another one of those, some ancient old a Asian philosophy that, uh, that is very interesting in itself, but probably doesn't work. So then fortunately, finding somebody like Ajahn Chah in Thailand, he was very practical, he was not a, a metaphysician or, you know, a philosopher. He was putting, bringing me right down to earth in the nitty-gritty of daily life, mon daily life monasticism, which was, you know, dealing with very ordinary things. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down, breathing, putting on your robes, eating your food, walking on the bindabot on the arms round, cleaning your arms bowl, and all the most kind of ordinary, kind of mundane uh, details of monastic life were part of the mindfulness, being with what you're doing, knowing time and place, having this sense of what is appropriate, what is suitable for time and place, being with the situation, the time, the place, the people, and being able to respond to life as you experience it. Awareness, mindfulness, sati panya, sati sampachanya, this, 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 this is our way of being able to respond to the uh, experiences, the contingencies uh, of a human existence. But not be, no longer deluded by them, no longer, uh, you know, liking, being caught in our likes and dislikes or our loves and hates. So it is a, a tra you know, a way of of living, of, of developing this awareness. And that takes this surrender, this surrender to this awareness. And to surrender to awareness, you have to recognize what you're surrendering to. You can't surrender to an abstract idea. You have to, is it, can you surrender to awareness? What is it? What am I surrendering to? When I say surrender to the awareness,
surrender, then this word is like giving up totally to it, isn't it? Being it, in other words. I'm, I'm no longer taking a personal interest yeah, you know, and, and 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 just employing this part time, and and uh, and uh, you know, only on meditation retreats, uh, you know, special situations. Well, we you know, is will I surrender to mindfulness? But you know, so that's that's another you know delusion. So it's it's not a, you know this is something you can't command anyone to do, but it's an encouragement. Using words like surrender in the Four Noble Truths, isn't it? The Third Noble Truth is realizing the reality of when things cease, when conditions cease. This point of cessation, where we, that uh, surrendering or realizing this awareness allows us to See the rising and ceasing of conditions, thoughts, emotions, memories. So then exploring this, and what is the, is there anything else to surrender to? And then, uh, you know, just to, to question, to observe. What, when we take refuge, when I take refuge in Buddha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, what does this mean? It's like surrendering to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. These are, the, these are the words. But the reality, what is the reality of that at this moment? And so this is questioning yourself. What is the reality of Buddha Dhamma Sangha here and now? And this is questioning in order to point to this awareness, this poised attentiveness, this listening, receptivity. It's this. So you realize the Dhamma, the way it is. And the thinking mind, thinking ceases. You have to let go of thought. If you don't, if you, you can't think yourself into surrendering. It's letting go of thinking. So then uh, I use this, uh, what I call sound of silence, as the point of surrender. Because that, the thinking stops. This uh, resonating vibration, background, Surrendering, being, in other words, just being this, not becoming someone who practices anymore or who listens to the sound of silence or anything like that, but being this. And by reflecting in this way, then, the, then this gives me the perspective to, re, to observe the the panya then can operate in order to see suffering and non-suffering. See what attachment is and non-attachment to discern what self is, what non-self is, what anatta is, the reality of anatta, non-attachment, non-suffering. And so then you, you uh, by reflecting in this way, you, you have the, in, the insight, knowledge. This is the way. This is the path. The matima matibata, middle way. The awareness. It's here and now. Timeless. Come and see. Leading wherever. 
Bajjatang Waiti Dapo Vinui, which is to be experienced individually by the wise. Somehow the English translations is kind of murder the meaning. <laughs> and uh, Ajahn Chah used to use the word bajjatang. In, in Thai, they take the Pali words and, and, and Ajahn Chah say, Bin budgetang, bin budgetang. Keep it's it's budgetang. It's to be realized, you know, here, see individually. You to know it yourself. And people say, well, then, Paul, what about nibbana and anatta and all that? Blah, 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 blah. Explain all this. And he says, bin budgetang. So, I'll stop here. The, this, the Sangha has decided to sit up till midnight. It's true? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't consult me, you know, I wasn't at the decision maker. So. <laughs> so, uh, you also, lay people are invited to uh, participate. <clears throat>